Perfect. The show tonight is going to be Rabbi Bressinger, uh, followed by, we have another um, pl uh, another uh, employee at uh, Chabad Lifeline, Rabbi Abenheim, followed by Dr. Abed's presentation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Rabbi Bressinger. He's a Montreal native, and he has dedicated his life to serving those affected by addiction. He graduated from the Rabbinical College of America, Kolo, in 1991. That's my alma mater. We actually know each other from back then. We go way back to New Jersey. He and his wife, Karen, were appointed by the Rebbe to represent Chabad in Metro West, New Jersey, where he became a pastoral counselor for Jewish addicts in recovery. During this time, he authored a course on addiction and spirituality, which he presented in cities around the U.S. In 2007, Rabbi Bressinger and Karen, who holds a master's in social work from Rutgers University, returned to Montreal to become the director and clinical director, and clinical director respectively, of Chabad Lifeline. So Rabbi Bressinger is director, and Karen is clinical director. Uh, Chabad Lifeline is a nonprofit, non sectarian addiction counseling center. Under their leadership, the center has grown significantly with a staff of 20 working tirelessly to treat everyone touched by the pain of addiction, regardless of their background, religion, or financial situation. Everybody, round of applause for Rabbi Bressinger. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. It's good to have you here. It's important to have you here. Tell people where you were. You never know who might hear that and eventually, hopefully, call for help. Before I begin, I need to introduce some very key people. This is my wife, Karen, in the back. Say hi, Karen. Karen and I are co-directors of Chabad Lifeline. Um, I also want to mention Rabbi Fine, Rabbi Ronnie Fine over here, who is the executive director. It's only because of Rabbi Fine's vision and leadership that we're able to be wherever we are. He took it upon himself in 1989 to start Project Pride, which would evolve to become Chabad Lifeline. Rabbi Fine. And then there are two people in this room who are people who have done more for addiction, I think, than anybody else that I know of in Montreal. This is Mr. and Mrs. Wiltser, who are the part of the executive. Mr. Wiltser is the chairman of the executive of Chabad Lifeline. And uh, not only addiction, but from previous being the president of the Jewish General Hospital, and especially the initiative as far as the psychiatric ward, I think that we can say it's not just addiction, but it's people with mental health and physical health. These are two individuals who we owe a lot to in many ways. And we thank you. Okay, let me tell you who I am. So I grew up in Shawmody, and I, my mother called me, everyone called me. My name was Barry. And then somewhere around when I was 23, I ended up changing everything. I went off to Israel to rabbinical school, and I told my mother from rabbinical school in Jerusalem, don't ever call me Barry again. You call me Benjamin. That's what you named me at my bris. You called me Benjamin. And she answered, Barry, I'm coming to get you. <laughs> Have you ever heard that story before? Yeah. Today, yeah. Growing up in Shawmody, in a family of four children. Um, my brother, when I was about 11, um, manifested bipolar disorder to the extreme. Coupled with addiction, he was then 17, I was 11, or 12, my sister was 11, and I, had an older, I have an older sister too. What we saw as siblings in the home, nobody should see. What we saw were parents who were absolutely helpless, didn't know what to do, where to turn, who to talk to. We're talking about the police coming on a regular basis. We're talking about my brother disappearing and ending up across the country, in jail ultimately. And in jail, he was diagnosed bipolar. He was in jail in Calgary. And he was transferred to the Jewish General Hospital Psychiatric Ward, where I went to visit him. And that left a mark on me I'll remember forever. And 
part of my life's mission is to find these 11, 12, 13-year-old siblings, the hidden victims of addiction and mental illness. And that's what I want everyone here to consider and take home with you. There are children now in homes that are ex experiencing great, great chaos. There are children now in homes that are suffering alone. Because you know what? There's another sibling who's taking all of the attention. It makes sense. Keep in mind those other children in the home, the hidden victims, and let them know, let the parents know, you should know, there is an organization in Montreal dedicated to helping these children free of charge, immediately, with very qualified, fantastic staff on our youth, in our youth department. We've been at this, my wife and I have been at this for about 30 years. And I try to count how many people's stories I've heard in those years. Besides the fact that every Tuesday at noon we have someone coming in telling their story and I invite everybody and anybody to come. Incredible. Besides the Tuesday, so let's say I'm at 30 of them a year, maybe, 15 years. But all of the other people for all of these years, I estimated somewhere around a thousand stories. Let's see what we can take from those thousand stories. What are we hearing over and over again? The number one thing I think that I hear over and over again, people with addiction are dealing with great pain. This is not about a choice as Dr. Rabin will show you. This is not to have fun, could start possibly, but what addiction basically is, is a coping for, a coping way, a way to cope with great pain. I'll tell you a story. There was a, a lady, I, I've told this before because it's, when we opened Chabad Lifeline under the auspices of Jewish General Hospital, and we had a speaker. The speaker, she described, she was then 40. She described when she was 11 years old, she said up until that point in her life, she doesn't remember breathing regularly. Her anxiety was so heightened. It was normal for her then. She didn't know any other way. But she was so anxious. Someone gave her a shot of alcohol. She remembered, she described and she remembered, remember she was 40, talking about when she was 11 or 12, right? She said, I remember like it was yesterday, the feeling of the alcohol going down my throat, she said. And all of a sudden a sense of ease happened. That's addiction. The extremes. Many people are nervous, many people are anxious, of course. But the extreme where she doesn't remember breathing properly, anyone ever have a panic attack? This is like with a normal way she was functioning. The extreme. And then the extreme the other way. One shot, instant relief. That's addiction. We can't judge that. Go ahead and try. We're missing the whole point. It's about pain. Another thing we've heard over and over and over again is knowing from very young, not thinking, knowing from very young that there was something wrong, that they were different, they felt different, they felt that they were always on the outside looking in. <coughs> Isolation, disconnection, over and over again. We've heard so many times that families, all doing the very best they can, that have possibly rigid family structure, very rigid. <coughs> they, oh, I hear that a lot from people. That was something that, God forbid, does not create an addict but contributes. And also, surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, on the other end, Completely free reign, both extremes. <coughs> 
something else was that they were getting high, not to get high, but to feel normal. So now that I've shared with you 30 years of observations, I hope you can take to heart. And next time you hear about addiction, next time you think about it, next time especially, hopefully, when you talk about it, it's a different thing. And that's our goal for tonight. With Dr. Rabin's help, we're going to understand a little bit about the brain science involved. So let's move forward with the program. I'm going to invite Rabbi Abinayim to come up in just a moment. Is Abba here? Did Abba Brat show up? No? Sorry? Abba um, was key from the Federation, um, the Jewish Federation. In brainstorming with me, he said, we have money to have Jewish organizations collaborate. Let's do a collaboration. Let's fund it. I said, oh, I want so desperately to be able to be embedded in community organizations with a representative whose goal would be addiction awareness, addiction prevention. And he bought it. Not only did he buy it, he loved the idea. And he funded us $80,000 to do that. That's a caring federation. And very grateful to be part of this Montreal community because there's a tremendous amount of support here. I actually dealt with a police officer just a few days ago. And he said to me, what's with you Jews? <laughs> you Jews, like, not just taking care of yourselves. You're taking care of so many who aren't Jewish. And I told him, in Chabad Lifelon, I believe, it's the greatest example. And this is what the Lubavitcher Rebbe wanted and wants of pro-Semitism. So I want to introduce you to Rabbi Ibn who can come up now. He's going to tell you a little bit about what the grant is and what he's been doing since. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rabbi Bressinger. It is a great privilege for me to be here tonight and to be a part of Chabad Lifeline. As Rabbi, Men Rabbi Bressinger mentioned, my name is Rabbi Ruven Abinaim, and thanks to a grant by the Federation, I was hired by Chabad Lifeline as a liaison to serve as a bridge between three Jewish organizations, one of them being Chabad NDG. My goal is to help promote awareness and prevention of addiction and to help remove the stigma of addiction within our community. Once a week on Tuesday evenings, I am available at Chabad NDG to provide any information about our services, to help make referrals to our clinicians, and to help in any way possible. I am a life coach and counselor. Being a listening ear with empathy and care is my passion. I would like to go over the many services that we offer at Chabad Lifeline. To start, all of our services are available immediately and are completely confidential and at no charge. We work with people suffering from various substance and or behavioral addictions. Substance addictions can include alcohol and drugs, and behavioral addictions can include sex, gambling, internet, smartphone, and gaming. Our staff includes social workers, addiction counselors, trauma-based therapists, music and drama therapists. We also have a CSAT on our, on our staff. CSAT stands for sex addiction, uh, Certified Sex Addiction Therapist. We understand how strongly addiction affects the entire family. For that reason, we provide counseling and programming for partners, parents, and siblings of the addict so that we can help the family heal together. When someone gives us a call, there is no waiting list. They are immediately invited to join our groups, and then an intake and assessment is made so that the appropriate treatment can be provided. They are then provided one-on-one -on -one counseling and daily group meetings that deal with topics such as addictions, 
communication skills, codependency, self-regulation, meditation, self-esteem, nutrition, budgeting, communication skills, parenting, and more. We have a great youth department that is dedicated to supporting youth at risk and those growing up in homes affected by addiction. In addition to counseling the youth, the youth department also includes parent coaching services, parent workshops, parent support groups, and screen addiction groups. We also have a youth outreach program, which includes pre presentations to youth at schools and a professional development training for professionals working with youth. Every Tuesday at noon, we have an open speakers meeting. Each meeting includes a recovering addict who tells his or her story. There's warmth, sharing, inspiration, and both seriousness and laughter. They are open to everyone affected by addiction, loved ones of addicts, and anyone interested in experiencing raw and moving stories of recovery. It is a great place for anyone to get the feel of our place and for what we offer. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Your participation and support is so much appreciated. I am always available to help, be it on Tuesday nights or any other time with a listening ear and an open heart. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the newest member of our team, Dr. Rachel Raven, who joins us as addiction research specialist. Dr. Raven received her bachelor's degree in psychology from McGill University and her master's and PhD in medical science at the University of Toronto. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai before joining McGill University as an assistant professor in 2020 in the Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Raven's research focuses on developing a better understanding of the clinical, cognitive, and underlying neurobiological mechanisms implicated in the development and maintenance of addic addictive behavior, addictive disorders. Her hope is that this work will lead to much needed and impactful treatments for people suffering from addiction. She now joins Chabad Lifeline in the newly created position of addiction research specialist. Without further delay, Dr. Rachel Rabin. So I'm just gonna get my slides up on the screen. I think we have to do a little shuffle with the computers. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, okay, wonderful. So I feel really honored to be here. So thank you all. And Dr. Bressinger, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, yeah, you know, I think this is such an important cause and such an important mission. And I think that the reason why Dr. Bressinger and I make such a good match is just because we have this shared goal. And the shared goal is to educate the community about what addiction really is. It's probably one of the most misunderstood psychiatric disorders, so that I hope that today's presentation can clear up some of those misconceptions, it can reduce some of the stigma around addiction, and it can encourage people to go and seek treatment. Um, so today I'm gonna share with you how addiction should be conceptualized as a brain disorder. So it will be focused very much so on the brain, and I will walk you through why we should all think of addiction um, as a brain disorder. Okay, um, so substance use is common, and if you were to survey the room, you know, more than 60% of the room would admit to having used an addictive substance in the last month. So the most common substances that people use are alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. And just to know that this is data from the U.S., but the proportions in Canada are very similar. But we all know that not everyone who uses a substance will develop an addiction. So in Canada, about 20% of the population will meet criteria for an addiction in their lifetime. And this, this percentage is huge. Um, that means that one in five people in their lifetime will have an addiction. And this is greater than any other psychiatric disorder, which we keep hearing about how prevalent psychiatric disorders are. So addiction does not discriminate, it can affect anybody. It can affect people regardless of their age, their gender, 
their race, their religion, their socioeconomic status. Okay, so what I really want to drive home today is what addiction is. And what it is, is a chronic relapsing brain disorder characterized by a compulsive desire to use a drug despite very catastrophic consequences. Now, I know that's a lot to digest, so I've broken it down um, into three very simple points. So it's compulsive use in the face of consequences. What many people don't know is that it's an associated with a decreased pleasure from the drug. And it involves a loss of control over use. And the consequences that ensue from addiction can include employment problems, loss of interpersonal relationships, neglecting household responsibilities, financial problems, medical or psychological problems, and even death. And unfortunately, death is a growing consequence of addiction. In Canada, 10 people are dying every day from opioid overdose alone. And this graph shows an upward trend which suggests that we can expect this number to grow even larger in the coming years. So commonly when we think of addiction, we think of it as it relates to substances. Things like alcohol, nicotine or tobacco, cannabis, cocaine, opiates and hallucinogens. But addiction can also be behavioral. So when we define it as a behavior, we think about it in terms of an inability to control, regulate, or limit a specific behavior. So behavioral addictions can include sex, pornography, shopping, technology, or gambling. And just to note that these are just examples. These lists are far from exhaustive, meaning that many other addictions beyond the ones listed here um, may be present. So when we think of addiction as a brain disorder, we need to think of it like a genuine chronic medical condition. Okay? It has a biological basis, meaning that we can see it in the brain. It is a chronic disease of the brain. And we know this because we can see how changes in the brain negatively affect how one then processes information around them. And so I want you to think about addiction as a brain disease, just like you would think about diabetes as a disease of the pancreas and heart disease as a disease of the heart. All of these disorders, they disrupt the normal healthy functioning of an organ in the body. And so like other chronic diseases, addiction is a lifelong disorder. It involves cycles of relapses and remissions. And so what I really want to stress and what Dr. Brissinger uh, alluded to before is that addiction is not a choice. It's not a bad habit. It's not due to a weakness of character. It's not a lack of self-control or willpower. And understanding what addiction is not will help us reduce the stigma that surrounds addiction. So when we think about addiction as a brain disorder, one of the benefits of this is that it can be treated and recovery is possible. So without treatment, addiction will just get worse it disrupts all areas of one's life. It extends to the family, which we just heard about. And it can even result in premature death. So without treatment, addiction will never get better. And it will always get worse. So I'm going to talk a lot about tonight about how addiction develops and how it's maintained. Okay? So here is the cycle of addiction. And this is how brain scientists think about addiction. It's characterized by three different phases that just cycle around. Okay? So these phases are the binge intoxication phase, which is when the drug is being consumed, the withdrawal negative affect phase. This is when the drug is stopped, and people kind of like generally refer to it as like the crash. And when people become preoccupied with finding the drug again or acquiring it, and this is the drug-seeking phase. So each phase of the addiction cycle is associated with a different brain region. Okay? And these are the brain regions here. Okay? So this is not going to surprise everyone, but people use drugs to get high. 
And uh, when we talk about using drugs and getting high, we're talking about a process in the brain. And this is where massive amounts of dopamine are being released in the rewarding, rewarding regions of the brain, and this is called the basal ganglia. Okay? There's no test after, so don't worry if you can't remember any of these scientific brain names. Okay? Has anyone heard of dopamine before? Okay. So most people know that dopamine is a neurochemical in the brain. It acts as a messenger, and it has a rewarding quality to it. When we have dopamine release in the brain, we feel pleasure, we feel all euphoria, you know, um, and that's why it's referred to as rewarding. So dopamine release in the brain is a natural process, and it's in place to help us motivate us to repeat behaviors that help us survive as a species, okay? So we all get a dopamine release when we eat a very satisfying meal, um, maybe when we eat chocolate, when we spend time with people we love, when we learn new things. These are all natural processes that release dopamine in the brain. But what drugs do is that they hijack this reward system and they cause these massive, unnaturally large releases of dopamine in the rewarding centers. And no matter what drug we're talking about, they all have this feature, that they release dopamine in the rewarding region of the brain. And the same thing happens with behavioral addictions. So when that, be that specific behavior is repeated, that, that person will get a, a dopamine release in their brain. Um, okay, just want to make sure we're on the same page here. Yeah, okay. So I want to visually show you the difference of what happens uh, when we do a natural behavior and get a natural release of dopamine as compared to an addictive drug. So these studies were all done in rats, but they're actually very comparable to humans. Um, so in these studies, what happened is the rat had uh, like a little sensor implanted in his brain, and in that sensor, it allowed us to measure the amount of dopamine being released. So in this graph, um, on the lower line, this is what happened to the rat when he ate a low-fat diet. So you can see that the, the baseline levels of dopamine raised about 100 times. And when the rat was fed a high-fat diet, it, ra it raised to about 150. And I like this graph because it also explains why many people prefer like cookies and chips to fruits and vegetables. But the point here is that even with food, we get this natural release of dopamine um, about 100, 100 fold over as compared to baseline. But now look what happens when the drug is administered drugs. So something like amphetamine, or also known as speed, um, will increase dopamine levels more than a thousand, a hundred times more than what a natural reward is giving you. With cocaine, it's about twice as much. Nicotine, again, almost twice as much. Morphine, twice as much. And what's interesting about, about addictive drugs is the higher the peak and the faster the peak occurs, the more addictive the drug will be. So this next graph just sort of superimposes all of those um, natural and addictive drug rewards and shows you how much greater of dopamine release occurs with methamphetamine as compared to, to food, which is that lower line. So what addiction does is it hijacks the brain's reward system. Dopamine causes a much greater, sorry, drugs cause a much greater dopamine release in the brain than everyday pleasurable activities. And what the brain does is it creates this very strong memory of this pleasure and it wants it repeated. And what this does is it leads to very strong feelings of craving for the drug. And the brain now thinks that drugs have a lot of value and have a lot of importance and are crucial for survival. So, and this is at the expense of more natural rewards. So all of a sudden things like food, making money, you know, doing well in school have now been tagged as sort of having less value and less importance. What the brain also does, and I don't think this is as well known as it should be, is that the brain also assigns very high value of importance to anything that can remind that person of the drug. So any person, 
any paraphernalia, any place, any context, that thing or that trigger will also be assigned by the brain very high value. So if you remember back to uh, Psych 101, if you have anyone took it, or if you know anything about Pavlov. So Pavlov was a scientist in the early 1900s, and he proposed classical conditioning. And what he did was very clever. He had this dog. He had food. And when the dog saw the food, he salivated. And then Pavlov showed the spell to the dog, and nothing happened. But over time, Pavlov paired the bell with the food, and then after that, when Pavlov showed the bell alone to the dog, he salivated. This is classical conditioning. It happens in our everyday life, and it also extends to addiction. So what happens is that something that does not normally have any meaning on its own, by association, will become mentally linked with that high of the drug. And so with some, for someone with addiction, things that, have, that aren't the drug but have just become associated with it will take on that very salient motivational feature. And this happens even in the absence of the drug. So what it does is these triggers, these cues, can elicit very strong feelings of craving, that sort of uncontrollable desire to want something. And I, you know, people always like sort of make this connection between like cravings for chocolate or cravings for, you know, sweets. But I, I think this, this craving for addiction is, is at a whole new level because this is in the brain, it's biologically based. So some of the examples of these drug cues, um, and it'll give you a sense of how prevalent they are in one's environment, is, um, you know, certain places. So while some people would walk down the street and not notice a bar, someone with an alcohol addiction would walk by the street and probably notice, you know, the 10 bars, like in the downtown Montreal, their attention is fully captivated by these cues in the environment. Um, smell, a lot of us walk around now Montreal now that cannabis is legal, so it's not, you know, uncommon to smell marijuana, but that could be a cue also. A specific location, a specific person, you know, if people are doing drug deals on a specific corner, that corner then is tagged with that motivational salience. Same with money. Something as simple as money could have that sort of condition cue. And stress, something that we feel all the time in today's society could also have that kind of salient feature. And these triggers, what they do is they have a way of creating this tunnel vision for people with addiction so that all they see are these cues. And then the brain is just conditioned to expect the reward after seeing the cues. And that causes the person to feel these really strong feelings of craving. And then the person is just driven like a compulsion to try and satisfy that craving and at any expense. And I think that's what sets apart addiction from the love of chocolate or you know, the love of something else, is that they will do it at any expense. And this is why families are so affected by addiction, is because no consequence is too great to secure a drug. So what happens is, is these cues and the drug itself, uh, the brain becomes very hypersensitive to them. And that hypersensitivity and that classical conditioning I talked about is hardwired into the brain. And these, this conditioning, these links, are very difficult to overwrite. They stay in the brain for a very long time. And this is one of the reasons why relapse is so common in addiction, is because those associations stay in the brain. So someone who's been in remission for a year, 10 years, they see someone that maybe they did drugs with, you know, a decade ago, that same craving will be triggered. So I just, you know, what we try to do in the lab and in science is we try to, you know, the reason why we know all that information is because we've tested it in the lab. And so I just 
you know, wanted to bring a little bit of the, the lab into this room tonight and show you um, one of the studies that was conducted in my postdoctoral lab and, and why it gives us so much evidence for this hypersensitivity. So what this experiment did is they brought in people without addiction and they brought into the lab people with cocaine addiction. And what they did is they, they sat them in front of the computer and on the computer popped up these images. And they, they fell into these four categories. They were their pleasant images, negative images, neutral images, or cocaine-related images. And um, while people were viewing these images, we strapped on an EEG cap. I don't know if any of you know what an EEG cap is, but more or less what it does is it measures electrical activity in the brain, and it gives us a really good idea of how aroused or reactive someone's brain is. And so we could see really clearly what was happening in the brain when people saw these images. So when we analyzed the data, this is what we found. So when control saw these pleasant images, their brain lit right up. And that's what the red is showing, that all these hotspots, all this arousal. When they saw the negative images, same thing. Negative images can also be very provoking. And when they saw when they saw the cocaine images, it was like see, seeing a very neutral image, just like seeing the rolling pin. It had no effect whatsoever on their arousal. When we did this to people with cocaine addiction, we saw a very different pattern. So when people with cocaine addiction saw pleasant images, you know, it was like they weren't aroused. And that's the thing that I was talking about is that the addiction starts to uh, take hold of other natural reinforcers, and then those things become less pleasurable, less arousal, less, less rewarding. Um, we saw a little bit more reactivity to the unpleasant images, but then when they saw drug cocaine, like cocaine cues, their brain just lit right up. And just, you can see it in the contrast between controls and cocaine, how reactive these people are to just images on the screen. Uh, and what I also wanted to show you is we also had this cocaine addiction group who had been abstinent. And the abstinence ranged from anywhere from a week to 10 years. But I think this, this part is very powerful because you can see that even someone who's been absent for some time, those cues are still very salient. Their brain still lights up just as much as someone who's currently using. And why this study is so important is because this arousal correlated and was directly linearly associated with how much these people were craving cocaine. I also wanted to draw the parallel to behavior addiction. So a similar study was done in people with um, pornography addiction. Uh, the, the images look different because uh, these people were put into an fMRI scanner or an MRI scanner, and their brain activity was looked at um, through functional magnetic imaging. Um, but irrelevant, the point is, is that the same pattern was shown when these people with pornography addiction um, were shown pornography cues. Again, their brain lit right up, and you could see the difference between healthy volunteers or the control group and people with... Um, pornography addiction. And so it's that same pattern that we saw with cocaine addiction. So what I really want to drive home is that these drug cues are driving craving, and the craving, you know, is a big predictor of whether or not someone will use drugs or relapse. So these cravings lead to an overwhelmingly strong motivation to prioritize drugs and choose drugs in spite of the pain of other people, in, in spite of any consequences or any negative effects. And these cravings, they're so strong that they override any plans to change, to cut down, or abstain from drugs. And what happens is that we see this continued pattern of drug use. Um, so, the next thing I want to talk about is what happens when people use drugs again and again and again. Is Again, we see changes in the brain. And we, we probably have all heard of the term tolerance. Um, you know, 
kids talk about it, like our university students talk about it when they go out drinking, that they can drink three drinks and not feel so drunk. Um, and they used to be able, be able to only drink one drink. Well, they were talking about it on a much bigger level. So tolerance is what happens when people continually repeat drug use and the same amount of the drug is now not producing the same effect. And we can see why this is happening in the brain. So this here is like a, a little dopamine neuron. Uh, these little pegs are what we call receptors and these little dots that are hanging out are dopamine. And when the dopamine attaches to the receptor, it's like a lock and key. This reaction happens, which gives us that pleasurable feeling. But over time, what happens is the brain, it's very plastic. It likes homeostasis, it likes balance. So when it senses too much dopamine, it starts to you know, uh, turn back, it's like turn back and dial down. So these receptors uh, more or less disappear. And with that disappearance, people will have less of an effect of the drug. So now the high doesn't feel as high anymore. And what do people do? They start using more because they're chasing that high. And no, they, there's, no more, there's no amount of drug use that they can use that will give them that same high because their brain has changed. And I think this slide is a very powerful slide because I think it depicts something that not many people know about addiction. And that's that over time, this wanting of the drug increases this craving, but the liking of the drug, the pleasurable effects, they go away. And so, you know, this isn't a habit people are doing because now they enjoy it. If you actually talk to people, if you can get them to open up to you, they will likely report that they don't even like the drug anymore. They don't even want to use it, but they are driven, they are compelled to use beyond their control. So just to uh, give a little summary of that first phase, um, just to remember that the brain becomes hypersensitive to the drug cues. They elicit strong feelings of craving that often result in drug use or relapse. With progressive drug use, craving for the drug increases while liking decreases. And this cue craving association uh, is stored in the brain as an enduring memory, making relapse possible even after very long periods of abstinence. And although I'm not drawing in behavioral addictions as much as I would like to, I just want to keep emphasizing that the same phenomenon is happening with behavior, behavioral addictions. Okay, so the second phase is the withdrawal phase. This is when someone, I guess, like comes down from the high. Um, Usually it happens because the drug runs out. Uh, maybe if it's an alcohol addiction, they've used too much, they've passed out or they go to sleep. And in some cases, maybe people decide to quit um, and so then they enter into the withdrawal phase. And because of all those adaptations that I, I showed to you, um, when the drug is stopped or even reduced, the body really feels its absence. And the withdrawal symptoms can vary in type and severity. Um, but, I mean, everybody knows withdrawal symptoms are unpleasant. Uh, these are just a few. Sweating, nausea, trembling, problems going to sleep, staying asleep, chills, body aches, mood swings, irritability, cold sweats, cravings, vomiting, anxiety and depression, seizures. But there are more than this. And, um, you know, I don't think I can present anything with words that really can give the impact of how bad withdrawal symptoms can be. Um, but they can get very scary. And the more severe the drug addiction is, the more severe the withdrawal symptoms are. And withdrawal symptoms drive drug use simply because they make the withdrawal symptoms go away. So just to reiterate phase one, the rewarding effects of the drug are there, or they used to be there. People experience that strong wanting, that strong craving. In phase two, there's these intense withdrawal symptoms uh, when the drug is stopped or reduced. And so the go signals, the motivation to use drugs 
are, are very strong. And this brings us to the third phase, which is you know, this preoccupation phase. And now you can understand why someone would be so motivated and so compelled to acquire drugs in this stage. Um, so this stage involves the prefrontal cortex. Does anyone know what the prefrontal cortex does? Yeah, I hear executive functioning. That's exactly right. So the prefrontal cortex is like this part of your brain right up here. Um, you know, usually we call it the CEO of the brain because it's involved in anything a CEO would do. It performs reasoning, executive functioning, planning. Uh, it, weighs, it weighs out the pros and cons of, of making a decision. And um, I wanted to give an example of what our prefrontal cortex does by a situation that we probably all you know, have come into contact with. It's you know, when you go to a dinner party and the hostess offers you a second piece of cake. You know? uh, like, what do you do? And this is our prefrontal cortex at work. Um, so initially we're all like, yeah, and that was the most delicious cake I ever had. I want another piece. But then we take a second, we take a step back, and we go, okay, I'm pretty full. I don't need all those calories from the cake. So you know what? I, I'm going to decline. I'm going to pass. And, and that's our prefrontal cortex working really well. Um, you know, it's involved in self-control. It helps us put the brakes on our impulses. The problem in addiction is that people with addiction, they don't have a very good working prefrontal cortex. So their ability to inhibit impulsive behaviors is just completely impaired. They don't have the ability to resist temptation. And the way that I like to think about it is their stop signals are very, very weak. And we can see this deficit in the brain. So again, if we put people into an MRI scan, we can see very clearly on the scan, and this is pointed to in that orange arrow, that people with addiction have less gray matter volume or less brain material um, than people without addiction in this specific spot of the brain. And what we also see is that the more one uses the drug over time, the smaller that area of the brain will get. So that's kind of scary to think that their ability to put the brakes on will only get worse over time. And because these stop signals in the brain are so weak, it makes relapse you know, very likely. That the drive to surpass the drug Sorry, the, the drive to use the drug far surpasses these people's ability to, to inhibit drug use. So I just want to reiterate that addiction is a brain-based illness. It involves the rewarding centers of the brain. It also involves the affective centers. Sorry, I didn't really make that distinction when I was talking about the withdrawal, but that involved the amygdala, which we know is the affective center of the brain, and it involves the frontal regions. And what we know is that the brains of people with addiction look different, we can see this on brain scans, than people without addiction. Now I'm just going to end um, with a little bit about risk factors and then treatment, um, but I, I do just you know, want to talk a little bit about what makes someone likely to develop addiction. Um, I'd say the biggest you know, factor is someone's genetics, their family history, but also any trauma, um, especially if it happens early in life, personality, and also comorbidity. We know that addiction is just very linked to other psychiatric disorders. Uh, age is also a big one. So the younger someone is and they start using, the more likely they are to develop an addiction. And I, I just also wanted to add this little tidbit of information because I think this is so crucial that not a lot of people know but just why drug use in adolescence is so harmful. And it's, um, it's just because the, the teen brain is what we call under construction, still developing. The brain actually doesn't stop finishing developing until the age of 25. And the last part of the brain to develop is that prefrontal cortex. So uh, why we see drug use to be so elevated in adolescence is because they have a very high functioning go system, the rewards, of drugs feel even better for adolescents than they do for adults, 
and their prefrontal cortex, their ability to stop, is just underdeveloped. So we see a lot of risky behaviors um, in, in adolescent years. Um, and why I make this point is because that drug use in adolescents can actually change the brain and prime it to be more sensitive to develop um, psychiatric disorders, so things like addiction, other cognitive problems, and other psychiatric disorders, which is why we often see the two hand in hand. So developing, delaying the onset of first drug use is very critical for normal human brain development. And the Quebec government knows this, which is why we have the highest legal age for cannabis use out of all the provinces in Canada. Um, so here it's 21. The other provinces are either at 18 or 19. And so the last topic I'll talk about very briefly is just the importance of treatment and how difficult it is to, you know, to recover from, from addiction um, and how important it is for these people to connect with treatment centers like Chabad Lifeline. So we need to like, motivate these people to quit or reduce their use and, and work with them to prevent relapse. <coughs> So the biggest problem is that most people with addiction don't go and seek treatment. Uh, we hope that's going to change with Chabad Lifeline. Um, right now, the existing medications to treat addiction are poor, which is one of my driving factors to be in this area of research. Um, and right now, behavioral treatments are the best things that we can offer people with addiction, and they do have effective outcomes. So I just want to emphasize the importance of community and family and interpersonal support in the recovery of addiction, that it's unlikely a person with addiction can recover without these pillars. Um, so, you know, treatment has to be readily available. It has to address the multiple needs of not just the individual, but extend to their family. It has to integrate community support. Um, and people need to stay in treatment for for a long time, so the treatment facility has to be open to that. Um, so I guess that wasn't the last thing. The last thing that I will say was, uh, a question I get a lot is like, if someone quits, will their brain go back to normal? Will they see some sort of recovery? And uh, during my postdoc, you know, we did this really big survey of the literature we reviewed 45 different studies that have been done that, that looked like, that examined this exact question. And the short answer is yes, we do see recovery in the brain, in dopamine levels, in functional connectivity. So people, I hope this piece of information can motivate people to, to seek treatment and know that they can get better. So those are just examples, but um, I know that was a lot of science. Um, so if you only go home with three pieces of information, make them be these ones, that addiction is a brain disease, that it's not a choice, and that it is treatable, and that Chabad Lifeline can help with recovery. All right, so we're not letting you go just yet, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rabin. First of all, thank you for that amazing, amazing uh, presentation. You've learned so much. And I have some questions here. So um, um, I, think, I think these are questions that are mostly for Dr. Rabin, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna put you back here, exactly. I'm going to ask you questions on behalf of the crowd. You ready? All right. So a lot of questions here are relating to people with family members, people who are close to them, um, who are experiencing this addiction. So what can they do? What should they do? Or is there any kind of rules of what they should and shouldn't do uh, with their family member or close friend, et cetera, who's experiencing addiction? Any, anything yeah. you with them? I mean, I'm not a clinician. I'm a brain scientist. So this is why I, I you know, well, yeah, this is Karen why we make such a, you know, a nice team is because I think we complement each other. So I'll yeah. invite you to answer this question. The truth is, my wife should be here. Sure. <laughs> We're no? going to keep conning it up. She often. would. So the number one thing I think that is so counterintuitive is 
saving a child is not within our power. Meaning, if they stay in the home or if they leave the home, these aren't guarantees. Ultimately, the control doesn't rest with the parent or the sibling. So that, and I think especially important is what my wife is a specialist at and what she trains our clinical staff with over and over again is something called family systems. Family systems means the family together as a system, right? A system like an organism working together. The family as a system needs to be engaged in the healing process, not for the sake of the addict, because then you're once truly not engaged with healing. It's about each member of the family has to have a certain motivation, very hard, to work on themselves. What happens then is the system gets upset, right? So if one part of the system starts to improve, then the dysfunctional system starts to get affected. Doesn't guarantee that the addict, but it's not, that's not the idea. The idea is each one of us on our own, works on our own level of belief we can control things. Each one of our own, on our own, we're able to look at ourselves and say, okay, how can I gain back a certain sense of safety and security? How can I bring that back into my own domain versus leaving it with somebody outside of me to determine? And this takes work and this takes commitment. So I, I think that's number one thing. So we're, we've revolutionized, I believe, and with my wife's leadership, is that family members coming for help need to come for help for themselves, not in order only to change the addict. When it becomes only in order to change the addict, in a certain sense, manipulation comes in, control comes in, all these different things. So I think that's part of, I don't know if that answers the question, but part of it. So we have some questions about what differentiates the brain or, or the person of the addicts versus, so for example, some people um, will use a substance and not really be addicted to it, yeah. and other people will. A related question to that was also, is it because their prefrontal cortex was already smaller yeah. and they had less inhibition, or does it only become smaller because of the substance use? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, whoever's question that yeah. was. Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, the mic's off, oh. so just, just come oh, just speak talk? to the crowd. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's something that scientists, like we struggle with every day. It's very hard to do experiments in humans. So what we think is going on is that it's both. We, uh, a very good, uh, like, I guess a salient risk factor could be having, you know, uh, being very impulsive, being like a risk taker, sensation seeking, also, uh, like having increased pleasure from the drug, which, you know, that story at the beginning sort of, you know, resonated with some of the stuff that I've read about how some people just, you know, have a very different reaction to different substances and some people can feel like more of a rewarding effect um, as compared to someone else. Um, and so I think that would contribute to the development of addiction. The same thing with the prefrontal cortex. People can have you know, worse or underdeveloped stop signals, and so they just don't have that ability to control their desires. And why, why I brought in adolescence at the end is because most people with addiction actually start before the age of 18. In fact, only 10% of people with addiction will develop it or start using drugs after the teenage years. So that's why this adolescent period is such a crucial time. And we just like, if we think back to like high school or, or university around that age and we think of our group of friends, we can think of probably someone who may have been, you know, more impulsive, more of a risk taker. And those people just have certain characteristics that just make them more likely. So whether that's genetically based, um, you know, it, it probably is. And maybe it could be environmentally, maybe it was their family structure, you know, even like birth order could maybe have a, you know, an effect on how someone's personality develops. 
So, I mean, it's just, it's so complex, and there's no way we're ever going to narrow it down to exactly one thing. It, it's really this combination, this constellation of things. Along those lines, is it more likely for the child of an addict to become an addict themselves? Oh, yes. So the risk factor, uh, or the risk is about 40 to 60 percent of developing addiction if, if you have a parent uh, with addiction. Um, you know, it, I think it can even be higher than that because usually the household of someone with addiction has other risk factors. So in houses, households with addiction, we see more trauma, which is its own risk factor. We see like uh, less parental control, another risk factor. So again, it's, it's so hard to tease apart, but mm -hmm. for, for when I you know, do a lot of this interviewing with people with addiction, uh, family history, uh, you know, we can't even tease apart that <coughs> environment genetic part, but it's, set, it's so prevalent in the, in the people that come in for into the okay. We have some questions related to some specific types of addiction. So there's a few questions about food addiction. Um, we saw on the charts there that <coughs> cocaine or other drugs is like much higher dopamine effect than other foods. But then there's yeah. this thing, and you know, you hear on the news that sugar has a, like a stronger effect on the brain, more dopamine than cocaine. So how does food yeah. addiction work? If food is lower than drugs, does it go higher? What happens? Yeah, so food addiction would be something else. Uh, to be honest, I'm not really familiar with food addiction. I'm not sure if that's more of a behavioral addiction, like it's the behavior that's driving it, or if it's the, like, that's where you get the dopamine release, or if it's from the food itself. Mm -hmm. I think some people may get more of a dopamine release from sugar or chocolate than other people. Um, you know, those averages, first of all, those, those grass are from mice, so take that with a grain of salt, yeah. but, um, you know, in humans, most people would show similar, like the average would be less for food than it would be, you know, for drugs, and maybe some people would be, like, at the higher end of the mean, if that okay. makes sense. Um, we have a few questions about sex addiction. So one question is, is it possible for somebody uh, to be in a healthy relationship if they have a sex addiction. Another question is how do you tell if it's for a teenager, if it's just like the normal teenage thing going on or if it's really a problem? So two different questions yeah. on that. You need to refer to the okay. rabbi for this okay. one. What happened to the doctor? I thought I was a doctor. <laughs> to the doctor rabbi. 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 <laughs> so, so before I get to that question, I just want to say something else that the doctor and I have spoken about and that's such an important takeaway. He said, after all of this, that the brain can heal. That's an amazing thing. There's great, great hope. We talked about how from mother or father to child, you said somewhere around even 60%, maybe more, a chance of it happening again. People who are in recovery, people who are working on themselves, they're giving their children the opposite. Giving, having them have an addiction. They're giving their children something. Think about this for a second. When a child sees their parent working on themselves, and working on themselves, we shouldn't lose sight. Working on oneself means a lot of different things. I would argue the most important thing is one's own spiritual well-being. So when a child sees this in a parent, the parent gives the child something called hope. Hope is probably one of the greatest drugs as far as motivating. So, um, and, and the last, about sex addiction. So that could be asked about other addictions as well, as far as when you're seeing a young person, how do you know it's an addiction versus a, it's very hard um, with a young person because the consequences, which Dr. Rabin said is one of the determining factors is you continue doing with grave consequences. So losing a family, losing work, losing a marriage, an 18-year-old is not going to necessarily have those consequences. So it's really hard to determine, is this an addiction or it's not? But it's certainly a, a sign of leading to you know, self-sabotaging behaviors. What about a healthy relationship? Is it possible for some with sex addiction? I would say in recovery, it's not only possible, 
I've heard many people say that recovery, working on oneself, spiritual growth, emotional well-being, heightens intimacy more than if there wasn't an addiction. Okay, two more main themes. Did you get that part? I'm sorry. You got that part? No. Okay. All right. This is so crucial. Think about this. A person who has an addiction, and then that person enters into some type of radical change. They could hear bells all of a sudden. <laughs> the change could even be audible. So that, when a when person who has an addiction starts to transform with God's help, only with God's help, and with the help of places, I'm not going to say like Chabad Lifeline, I'm going to say places, a place, Chabad Lifeline, but with the help, then that particular person becomes much more spiritual, I would say, I would argue, much more effective, much more intimately available than a person who never had an addiction. The one thing that I left out, Dr. Abraham Tversky worked with addicts as a psychiatrist and as a rabbi for 70 years. And when he was asked, one piece that he got, what, what's the one thing to sum up your 70 years of clinician, of being a clinician as well as a researcher and an author? He said that people with addiction have a sensitivity to spirituality, a lack of tolerance for injustice than regular people. So we're talking about spiritual people whose spirit needs to be aroused and the world as we see it with God in hiding as we all can not see God, that's intolerable for somebody who has a spiritual bent. So we can look at something like that as somebody with great, greater potential than somebody who never had an addiction. Okay. We have two more themes. No. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait. There's, there's two more main themes to cover. Uh, one theme that came up here was the idea of trauma, which we talked about. Somebody mentioned, you know, Gabor Mate, who says that all addictions come from a trauma. So they were wondering what your comment on that. Somebody else asked if it's possible to relieve the pain of trauma, how that's done, to relieve uh, the pain of trauma before an addiction can happen, or if there's, if that, if there's such a thing. So any comments on that? Yeah, I don't think that trauma is a necessary cause in the development of addiction. We see it, and I think about 33%, a third of people we see with addictions have an early life trauma. What we think is going on is that early life trauma, amidst usually other risk factors, a lot of the time genetic, uh, can sort of prime the brain for the development of later addiction. But it's it's by far not necessary to have trauma to develop an addiction. So um, I don't want that message to get lost there, that people may still be vulnerable. Okay. Um, and last main theme was treatment. So first of all, 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 do all the addictions have the same treatment or are there different treatments? That was one question about treatment. Yeah. Um, so I'm from a psych psychiatric background. So, you know, when I go to psychiatric conferences and when we do psychiatric research, a lot of things that we talk about are, are how we can use medications uh, to treat people. So, the problem with medications right now is that there are none uh, for most disorders. So, alcohol uh, has some approved medications, uh, tobacco, which we're familiar with uh, probably, um, but things like cocaine use and cannabis use disorder, there's, there's no good treatment. So right now, behavioral treatments are pretty much the go-to for, for treatments, other than opiates, which has, is very uh, medically uh, based. Um, the treatments can be different in terms of medication, but for behavior, they're pretty much all targeting the same types of behavior, which is you know, sort of increasing self-control, um, you know, coping skills around how to resist cravings, and, and maybe the rabbi has some more thoughts on... I, I would just say anecdotally that medications, I would say there's a certain blessing that we don't have drugs, magic drugs. Because to stifle somebody, to numb somebody, 
There's something called jello. Jello is I push down on the cocaine, so my brain somehow is an inhibitor that pushes down on the craving for cocaine. Next thing you know, I'm eating more. I push down on the eating, and now I'm smoking cigarettes and I never did. So really, it's not the brain, it is the brain disease, but it's a spiritual ailment. And you cannot affect lasting change for a spiritual ailment if you're just going to base it on physical drugs. Okay, last question from, yeah, no. oh yeah, that's it. Last question from the thing here, and then if you guys, if people want, then they can go or they can continue talking, we'll put up the food. They will continue talking and at, like after yeah. this, we, we can, people exactly. can leave if they so want. So just last, exactly, so just yeah. last main question here from the list is, if, if you talk about comorbidity between psychiatric illnesses and addiction. So when it comes to treatment, which one do you do first? Uh, oh. I, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, what I see, like I work out at the Douglas a lot, what we see there is that most people will present or, you know, with their another psychiatric problem other than addiction first. Um, so if it's severe, something like psychosis, you know, bipolar, it, you know, people are more likely to catch on as those being disorders and they end up getting treated first, not because they're more deteriorating, but because maybe people notice them more. Uh, what we know about psychiatric disorders is that people's insight are, is really impaired across psychiatric disorders. So a lot of the times people have a really hard time acknowledging or even seeing that there's a problem. So, you know, a lot of cases that we, I hear about, people are, are being brought to the ER by the police, by a family member, you know, and then, then usually there are other, other psychiatric disorders get treated first. Um, not to say that that's the right way to do it, but okay. that's, that's, that's the, answer. That's the <laughs> lay of the land right now. Okay, that's the answer. So I guess that ends the main part of the program. If anybody wants to stick around, we have some uh, non-alcoholic drinks, and we have some desserts. Some sugar, some sugar. <laughs> uh, we'll be on the front tables if anybody wants to ask questions of anybody here and have continue the discussion. You're free. Thank you very much.